Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. We continue on our series called Rheumatology. In the previous video, we have talked about the pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis. Today, let's talk about the articular manifestations of this arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, as you know, increase white blood cells. Why? Because it's an inflammatory arthritis. We have rheumatoid factors. What are they? They are IgM against the FC portion of IgG antibody. ESR is usually high, CRP is usually high. The patient can suffer from scleritis, episcleritis, atlantoaxial subluxation. The typical age of presentation is 40 to 50 years of age. We have basal fibrosis in the lung, rheumatoid nodules, carditis and pericarditis and pericardial effusion and pleural effusion and rheumatoid nodules. And the arthritis, which is today's topic, you can have median nerve entrapment causing carpal tunnel syndrome, you can have anemia of chronic disease, and you can have Baker cyst, also known as popliteal cyst, behind the knee. With that being said, now let's get started. Joints are either fibrous, fibrocartilaginous, or synovial. Which one is affected by rheumatoid? And the answer is synovial, and this is really important. Not all cases of rheumatoid arthritis are the same. Rheumatoid arthritis exists on a continuum. Some patients will have just mild joint involvement. Other patients will have severe erosive joint deformity with subluxation, synovitis, malalignment, ulnar deviation, tenosynovitis, ligament dyslaxity, decreased grip strength, decreased range of motion, loss of function, and permanent joint damage. And some patients will start mild and progress to severe. It exists on a continuum. There is another disease that exists on a continuum called MS, multiple sclerosis. Could be mild, very mild in some patients, you don't even notice that. And it could be debilitating in other patients. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, I was talking to a lady about some current issues. And then after a long conversation, she said to me, now I'm gonna tell you a secret that no one else knows. I said, what? She said, I have MS. MS? I was at my cardiology rotation back in the day, so I said, ooh, MS, mitral stenosis. I'll need a stethoscope to figure that out. It's a low-pitched decrescendo-crescendo mid-diastolic rumbling murmur preceded by an opening snap followed by a presystolic accentuation causing a loud S1 sound heard best using the bell of the stethoscope at the mitral area, which happens to be at the left fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line just below the left nipple, heard best at the end of expiration when the patient is lying down in the left decubitus position. Suddenly, she yelled at me, stop, stop talking for a second. You're like a freight train that never stops. I have MS, multiple sclerosis, idiot. I responded, how come? You're healthier than me. So she kicked me in the butt and said, knock on wood. And that was the end of this relationship. Okay, none of this actually happened in real life. I just want to tell you a medical joke, which has an educational value. Yeah, she was stronger than me because um, I have a biceps of a thinking man. Clinically, rheumatoid arthritis has symptoms, complications, and associations. And symptoms could be articular, which is the topic of today's video, and extra-articular manifestation we'll discuss in a next video. So, articular could be upper extremities, C1, C2 joint, and lower extremities. C1, C2 joints also is going to be discussed in a separate video. Today, we'll talk about upper extremities and lower extremities, so let's get started. Rheumatoid is a chronic disease, more than six weeks of symptoms. Therefore, if you have pain in one joint that started two days ago and everything else is normal, sorry to break your heart, but you do not have rheumatoid. There is another type of arthritis that's also symmetric, but lasts less than six weeks, and this is viral. So, rheumatoid, more than six weeks. Inflammatory arthritis, and this is different from osteo, which is non-inflammatory. Therefore, cardinal signs of inflammation, unlike osteo. Symmetrical joint involvement, unlike osteo. Why symmetrical? Because O2 antibodies do not discriminate. Small joint involvement versus osteo. Osteo is large, weight-bearing joints. Polyarticular 
versus osteo, which is mono or oligo. By the way, rheumatoid can start as mono, oligo, or poly, but in the advanced cases, it's gonna be poly. What does poly mean? Five joints or more. Articular manifestations. In cases of non-inflammatory arthritis, such as the famous osteo, pain predominates. But in the cases of inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid, stiffness predominates. That's why in rheumatoid arthritis, stiffness lasts for more than one hour in the morning. In osteo, which has no predomination of stiffness, the stiffness lasts for less than 30 minutes in the morning. Okay, back to rheumatoid. Joint pain is worse in the morning, improves with activity. Why? Because you're washing out the inflammatory debris, therefore you are better in the evening. Joint stiffness. Morning stiffness for more than one hour improves with activity. So, in rheumatoid arthritis, both the pain and the morning stiffness improve with activity. This is different from osteoarthritis because if you remember, in cases of osteo, the stiffness improved by movement, but the pain worsened by movement because it's a biomechanical wear and tear. Symptoms of rheumatoid could be intermittent. Okay, I have no symptoms. More symptoms, less symptoms, more symptoms, less symptoms, more symptoms, no symptoms, more like this. Sometimes you have remissions. Here you have no symptoms. But the remission lasts for less than one year. If the remission lasts for 10 years, baby, it's not rheumatoid. Considered a variant of rheumatoid arthritis called palindromic rheumatism. Ooh. And we have the progressive rheumatoid arthritis. This carries bad prognosis, keeps increasing like that. Like a freight train that never stops. To use the analogy from my date that broke my heart. Again, articular manifestations are upper extremities, lower extremities, atlanto-axial joint. Rheumatoid arthritis of the upper extremities, the hand, most commonly affect wrist, MCPs, and PIPs. DIP is spared, and this is different from osteo because osteo involves the DIP and the PIP. Flexor tendon synovitis, because it's an inflammatory thing. Inflammation, synovitis, leading to decreased range of motion, decreased grip strength, and trigger fingers. Deformities, which are non-reducible and irreversible. What does irreversible mean? You can't go back. Sorry. Non-reducible. What does that mean? Okay, non-reducible. So, when you press on the patient's finger, trying to make them their fingers straight again it's not going to happen it's non-reducible because there is a disease in rheumatology that we will discuss later where these deformities are reducible you press on it with your fingers and the patient is healed like magic they will think that you're god or something but in rheumatoid non-reducible irreversible deformities include swan neck boutonniere Zeta thumb or Z thumb or Z line deformity, MCP subluxation leading to ulnar deviation. By the way, the ulnar deviation is at this level, not at this level. It's at the level of the MCPs and not the wrist. Some authors argue that at the wrist you'll find radial deviation. Anyways, what else? Piano key sign, which sounds romantic, but it's not so romantic. Joint destruction leading to erosion, osteopenia, joint space narrowing, and the horrible ankylosis, which is fusion. Flexion, contracture of the elbow. There is a difference between contraction and contracture. Contraction describes muscle, and most of the time it's normal. Contracture describes joint, and it's almost always pathology or always a pathology swan neck deformity some of you may have heard of it before but no one has explained it like this look at this beauty this swan okay neck look at the neck okay forget this the neck the neck okay the neck is like this it's flexed okay and the last knuckle is also flexed the last joint with the dip is flexed so you have flexion of the dip like this one and hyperextension of the PIP. 
Beautiful. This was probably named by a pathologist who was sitting in his lab after a rough day, trying to count the criteria of malignancy under a stupid microscope all day long. He was sick and tired of being sick and tired, decided to open the window only to witness a group of swans swimming and dancing in the lake. Instead of being mesmerized by such beauty, his mind drifted to his wife's hand who died last year of coronary artery disease caused by rheumatoid arthritis. So he decided to call this skeletal deformity swan neck deformity. This is so bad, by the way. None of this is true. I just made the story up while drawing the swan on my iPad. Just food for thought. However, the fact that coronary artery disease is the most common cause of death in rheumatoid is absolutely true. Even my fiction has something to learn from. Go figure. So here we have swan neck deformity, flexion of the DIP, like the neck, and hyperextension of the PIP. Contrast to that, we have something else called boutonniere's deformity. We have the opposite. We have hyperextension of the DIP and flexion of the PIP, the exact opposite. Please don't say extension. Extension is normal. This is hyperextension because it's a pathology. It's a subluxation. It's an erosion. It's a synovitis, etc. And I'm sure your professor did not explain it clearly like this. That's why he or she is a professor. He's not a famous YouTuber. Zeta thumb deformity or Z thumb deformity or Z line. Zeta is a Greek letter that looks exactly like this. We have hyperextension of the first IP. IP means intraphalangeal. First, because it's the thumb. What do you mean by IP? Do you mean the PIP or the DIP? Shut up, this is the thumb. Every other finger has PIP and DIP. The thumb only has one it's called IP. This is fifth grade when you were a kid. What else? We have fixed flexion and subluxation of the first MCP. So it looks exactly like this, like a beautiful Z, which is not so beautiful. The patient has deformities, but Zeta thumb deformity. Piano key sign. Sounds romantic until it's not. You might think that since the name is piano key, it has something to do with the fingers. Nope, nothing to do with the fingers. It's actually a subluxation of the distal ulna. Oh, this sounds horrible. Why? You have inflammation, because it's an arthritis, it's an inflammatory arthritis called rheumatoid, of the ulnar styloid. And you have tenosynovitis, which is inflammation of the tendon and its sheath. Of this muscle, do you remember the name? Extensor, because it's on the back or the dorsal surface of the arm. Carpi, because it passes here by the carpal bone. Ulnaris, because it's over the ulnar side. Anatomy, baby. Subluxation of the distal ulna and tenosynovitis makes the ulnar styloid unstable. It moves back and forth like a piano key. Dun dun, dun dun. This was probably named by a pathologist who, after being sick and tired in his lab, decided to go home and play a musical piece on the piano in memory of his deceased wife. And while playing the piano, his ulnar styloid process got inflamed. And so did the distal end of his extensor corpi ulnaris. The distal radio ulnar joint became unstable, his styloid process starting wiggling and dancing in its place like a piano key. So he decided to call it piano key sign. Rest in peace, darling, rest in peace. She will rest in peace. Meanwhile, all of the medical students will suffer forever trying to memorize all of this stuff. May God rest her soul and help us all. So we're done with the upper extremities. Let's talk about the lower extremities. Lower extremities. Rheumatoid arthritis involves the MTP, not the MCP, MTP. Metatarsophalangeal joints. Okay, chronic inflammation of the ankle and mid-tarsus, leading to pes plano vulgus, also known as pes planus. Pes plano vulgus. Not to be confused with Plano Texas is the same thing as Pes Planus, is the same thing as flat feet. So here is the normal arch, like mine, thank God. Here is the high arch or Pes Cavus. You see that in Charcot Marie tooth disease and Friedrich's ataxia. But in rheumatoid, you see this flat arch, also known as Pes Planus, also known as Pes Plano Valgus. I'll see you in the next video when we will discuss the Atlanto axial subluxation. 
and then we'll discuss complications and associations and later the extra articular manifestations. Say hi to Rose, my imaginary patient who has rheumatoid. If you want to know more about rheumatoid arthritis, including the likelihood ratio, go to patreon.com forward slash medicosis. There is a PDF there that you can download and it's yours forever, baby. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and join the tribe. Hit the bell to get notified. Go to Facebook. I have more than 100 cases there. You can support this channel and get all of my notes and notebooks and cases and everything that's fun at patreon.com forward slash medicosis. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Until next time, please be safe, stay happy, and study hard.